Good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning to our speaker, <clears throat> Krishna Kumar, who is uh, located at the moment in California. And this is our second session on Malayalam literature. As Krishna Kumar explained yesterday, we will be today hearing about three great contemporary poets who in fact happened to pass away in the, in the last uh, two years. Uh, and if I may add a personal note, I happen to be very close to one of them, uh, Professor Vishnu Narayan Nambudri, whom I met many times and stayed with and learned so much from. Uh, but I was also privileged to meet the great Akitam and to know indirectly about the work of uh, uh, Sugata Kumari because uh, she was involved in environmental work and social work. And there were many points of intersection with my own interests. So three great figures. And um, uh, I believe Krishna Kumar will show how in many ways they are in, in the continuity with what the foundations that he conveyed yesterday, but also they were great innovators, each of them in their own way. Krishna Kumar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Danino. And uh, another cold good morning from San Francisco. You can see that I am, uh, you know, buttressed with a jeans jacket and all that, which I don't generally wear, but you have necessarily to do that. In today's lecture, the organizers uh, generously allowed me to focus on a set of authors of my choice. So I have chosen three important poets, Akitam Achudan Nambudri, who was born in 1926. Sugata Kumari, who was born in 1932. And Vishwanarayan Nandam Budri, who was born in 1939. I should thank Ankita for choosing these three pictures. They are very representative in nature and very good pictures very sharp and thank you Ankita for that. These three people are very close to my heart and the three of them departed in a span of four months. Akitam passed away in October 2020, Sugata Kumari in December 2020 and Vishnarayan Namudari in February 2021. We have not yet reached his first anniversary. As Danino added a personal note on these three people, uh, I cannot add a personal note because uh, that would be my autobiography. I met uh, Srimadhi Sukhada Kumari when I was about 12 years old. And Professor Nambudari when I was about 18. My life has been determined, oriented, and guided by their moral example. I'm not talking about the literary example. They were my role models all through and uh, their passing away is a loss which I cannot cope with. I honestly believe that awards are meaningless adjuncts in evaluating any poet, but they have become so numerous and so important in any discussion now. Especially so when you speak to a set of people who are not native speakers of the language in question. So people who are out of Kerala will never know these three people. Therefore, I will begin and conclude by saying that these three poets are Sahitya Academy awardees, all the three of them. Akitam was bestowed with the Tyanpit Puraskar in 2019 and Sugudha Kumari with the Saraswati Samman in 2013. Hopefully by the end of my lecture and recitals, the insignificance of this information should be apparent to you. Interestingly and incidentally, both Akitam and Sugudha Kumari, though they were elder to Professor Vishnu, by about six and 12 years, 
they looked up to him in all matters literally or otherwise that should speak about uh, vishwanarayan nambudri because uh, he was such a revered figure what i propose to do is to bring the scene up to akitam and then start off with a short discussion on each poet prefaced by a translation and terminating with another translation so two poems each for uh, three poets so now about the setting we terminated the discussion yesterday on malayalam poetry with the concluding stanza of prarodhanam by kumar nashan agashangale andarashigalodum bhakshikkum agashamai ashan met death by water in 1924 in an unfortunate boat accident he was barely 51 years of age at the time of death the other two members of the trinity we talked about the the modern malayalam poet trinity so the others are ullur as parameshwarayar and valkul narayana menon ullur was a classicist author of a mahakavya by name uma kerala a historical mahakavya if you can call it so there are certain controversies about the veracity of history etc that's a different matter altogether a consummate scholar and a literary historian ullur is at his best in some short poems such as prema sangeetham annam indum etc his masterpiece is karna bhushanam vallathol authored a mahakavya too chitrayoga but his fame does not rest on the mahakavya his sahitya manjari volumes especially the first four volumes contain several short poems which made him very very popular he was even revered as the masculine avatar of saraswati a connoisseur of kathakali vallathol was a past master in incorporating the dramatic element in poetry as in shishyanum maganum it is a meeting of uh, parashurama and ganapati it's a domestic scene you could say with shiva parvati parashurama and uh, ganapati achinam magalum a, a more mature work in which shakuntala meets vishwamitra what sets valathol apart from the other two is valathol's spirit of nationalism and his unreserved support to the gandhian movement one of the most famous poems on gandhi in malayalam is written by valathol my preceptor enda gurunathan valathol was the one who founded kalamandal to revive and renovate the dance forms of kerala kathakali in particular in the next generation we find an unusual confluence of five major poets g shankara kurupa of 1901 to 1978 p kunjaraman nair 1905 to 1978 edasheri govindan nair 1906 to 1974 balamaniamma 1909 to 2004 and pailopulli shridhar menon 1911 to 1985 in the literature unfortunately is not abundantly available in translation even for serious literary enthusiasts hence one should be very wary of making blanket assertions that it was a unique feature of malayalam to have five major poets and that it is an unusual confluence etc nevertheless it appears reasonable to argue that it is an uncommon blessing shankara kurupa as some of you might be aware was the first recipient of jnan peet in 1965 munjiraman nair was an archetypal bard who wandered all over literally he wandered all over kerala and even out of kerala in search of what he called the nitya kanyaga the eternal virgin edasheri was perhaps the most robust of the lot who consciously moved away from the lilting music and sentimentality we referred to balamaniamma in yesterday's talk she is without doubt 
the most important woman poet of Malayalam. By the way, she was also bestowed in the Saraswati Samman. Vailopilli, whom we quoted on two occasions, I was closest to him of these five poets. He is our, our what uh, Dante would call Il Miglio or Fabro, the finest literary craftsman of Malayalam. One big name cries out to be mentioned here. That's of Changambura Krishnabrilla, 1911 to 1948, the Orpheus of Malayalam poetry. He was one who turned into a legend in his lifetime. Prolific, maverick, and magical, Changambura cast a spell on the poets and the readers alike. There were countless poets in Malayalam who took after him. And I believe it is not an influence which will die away soon. We also talked about N.V. Krishnavarir, the polymath poet. Along with Itasheri, he spearheaded a poetics far removed from that of Changambura. I am aware of the serious inadequacies, lapses and omissions of this inept summarization. But then I am only setting the scene to place the three poets in perspective. Now we start with Akitam and we will start with a short poem as promised. We will start with a short poem and end with a short poem. Here is one of the shortest poems, Chakram. Chakram would mean the same thing in every Indian language. Chakra means the wheel. Even uh, Gandhi's Charkha is a metathetical transformation of the word Chakra. Vijayatin kaigalil chuttikarangunnu vidyunmayamoru chakram purumatra polim karakatil nindadu viramichador mailarkum kanninagatoru kannullavar chilarennal paravadum devam Tiriyum bol vartula mengilu michakram tiriya dirike chaduram. I will attempt a, a very, very loose translation. The wheel. Please listen closely. It's a short poem. In the hands of victory revolves a dazzling wheel. In the hands of victory revolves a dazzling wheel. No one remembers seeing it at rest, even for a moment. No one remembers seeing it at rest, even for a moment. But those with an eye within the eye keep saying this. But those with an eye within the eye keep saying this. Though circular while in motion, this wheel is but a square. I don't know if you got it. Though circular while in motion, this wheel is but a square. Akitam is talking about the gap between perception and reality. And he is also bringing out the references of Alata Chakra, the, the circle made by brandishing a, a, a burning torch in the air and how because of the persistence of vision we tend to see a, a circle whereas there is absolutely no circle and Allah Sakra is a famous uh, metaphor which uh, our philosophers used and this philosophy this contemplation this meditation is what distinguishes Akitam but apart from this meditatively philosophical profundity, he is also one who was extremely experiential in nature. Man as I am, even my breast swelled up and flowed towards all living beings. This is quintessential Akitam. Love towards all things great and small has remained his ideal. 
After all, he was very 25 when he wrote, Absolute love would in course of time turn into strength. This is beauty. This alone is truth. And practicing it, one's utmost duty. Many are such revelations in Akitam's poetry. But Akitam avers that he never consciously strived for such insights. They always visited him. Indeed, he claims it is not he who writes, but someone within. No wonder his poetic career spanning over 70 years is not easy to evaluate. Akitam is his family name. There were no issues in the ancient family of Vedic scholars, and he was born as a result of propitiating many gods. He was named Achyudan, and the patriarchs of the family naturally wished that Achyudan will turn into a great Vedic scholar. When he was eight, he was initiated by his father into learning Rigveda. Amazingly, he started writing Malayalam slokas in Sanskrit meters on the walls of the temple, family temple or the nearby temple. He did not know that he was writing in a metrically perfect form. But his heart lay in sketching and painting, a skill he would put to great advantage in his writing later. You know, the poem we just, we, we just read out, uh, Chakram, it has been uh, sort of uh, transformed as a painting by his uh, internationally renowned painter brother, artist brother Akitam Narayanan, who specializes in uh, tantric paintings. And his son is uh, very close to you people in IIT. He is in Baroda. He is Akitam Vasudevan, a, another famous painter of the family, um, disciple of Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. He joined the college after passing the matriculation examination, but could not continue his studies further. Poetry sustained him all through these years. But it was his meeting with one of those five poets whom we talked about, the legendary poet Edasheri Govindan Nair, 1906 to 1974, we talked about just now, that gave a new direction to his poetic pursuits. Akitam gratefully regards Edasheri as his mentor and maintains that it was Rashiri's ruthless tutoring that helped him grow as a poet. His first collection of poems came out in 1946. Three years later, he got married, and Akitam celebrated it with another book of poems. Predictably, like many other poets of Malayalam, Akitam started writing against the evil practices of his community, Nambudari community, the Kerala Brahmin community, with a reformatory seal. Those were the days when communist ideology was taking roots in Kerala. EMS Nambudari Pad, our first chief minister of Kerala, with whom he had long-standing familial ties, was writing primers on socialism and communism. Akitam was drawn to communism by these writings. But curiously, it was Rigveda that reaffirmed his faith in communism. Akitam asserts that the Samvada Sukta of Rigveda, Samano Mantra, Samiti Samani, which talks about the communion of, communion of minds, is proto-communist literature. Akitam turned a fellow traveler and remained so for nearly seven years, from 1943 to 1949. Akitam had by then established himself as a poet of repute. He had published many books of poems. He was also well known as a social activist. It was easy to graduate from Samvada Sukta to communism, but it was difficult to come to terms with the theory of class war. For the simple reason that Gandhi's hold on him was too great to be shaken off and would not allow a continuing relationship with the Communist Party, which anyway was very ambiguous. Akitam never became an official member of the Communist Party at no point in his life. He has an interesting sentence on that. I could not make myself believe that the purpose of my life was to become a member of the party founded by Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Probably it was the Calcutta thesis calling for armed revolution 
which settled the issue for him. Probably it was the death of his firstborn which turned him towards contemplation, meditation and spiritualism. He chose to publicly recant his faith in communism. Initially, he wrote three stanzas and thought it was all over. Here are those three stanzas in translation. Again, it is in the epic meter, Anushtuk. As I shed a teardrop for others, as I shed a teardrop for others, there arise within me a thousand suns. As I expend a smile for others, shines within me a full moon, eternal and serene. I never knew of this heavenly bliss before. Lamenting over that great loss again and again, I weep. These stanzas now preface the famous, you can call it infamous, in any case, controversial poem, the epic of the 20th century, just short of 800 lines in length divided into four cantos. Written as the confession of a repentant communist, Akitam waited for many months before he sent it to press because he was mortally afraid. Finally, it was at the behest of Edasheri, his mentor, that he published it in the premier journal Madhubhumi in August 1952. Please mark the date, August 1952. That was the time many intellectuals all over the world, for example, Andre Gide, Arthur Kessler, and Stephen Spender, to name a few, were talking about the God that failed. Here was Akitam from a remote village in Kerala, independently essaying on the basic impiety of communism. Arguably, Epic is the first major poem in Malayalam which was opposed on political terms. And what is generally true of classics is uh, equally true as regards epic as well. It is hardly re read in entirety. Again, as in the case of many classics, some couplets tend to outshadow and outweigh the poem itself. Here is one such couplet. Sobbing, I told this to the future citizen. Sobbing, I told this to the future citizen. Light, O oh young one, is sorrow. Light, O oh young one, is sorrow. Darkness is pleasurable. He uses the word tamasa. Tamasa lo sukhapradam. Valicham. Valicham is prakasha. Light. Dukkha manumi. It is sorrow. Darkness is pleasurable. Arguably, again, this is one of the most quoted couplets from modern Malayalam poetry. It would appear as though it has flown away from its appointed space in the poem and perched itself in totally different discursive spheres. Ranging from everyday speech, if there is a power cut in the house, people say, Velicham dukha manunni, tamasallo sukha pradam. Light is sorrow. Darkness is pleasurable. To political cartoons, gaining in contra signification. For the poet's detractors, it has come in handy as a stick to beat him with, as an evidence of his alleged regressive socio political stance. Acquiring the status of an aphorism, it has now become the bane of the poet, dubbing him as the enemy of the people. But Akitam was primarily concerned about these people, people who unsuspectingly fell or even now fall victims to the designs of the Communist Party and its leaders. People who laid down their lives in the war of liberation. He was basically opposed to the inherent element of violence. He always used to assert that vengefulness cannot ever give birth to peace and happiness. Akitam believes that over the last 50 years or even 60 years, ground realities of international polity have proved him right and that the poem has gained an eternal relevance. 
It is not just with the red flag and the rosary beads that Akitam hustled. The disparateness of what he learned by rote and what he actually confronted. He has a famous line, with the mouth that chanted the Vedic hymns, I was made to swallow nauseating fish and meat. We talked about the innumerable social pressures which rocked Kerala in the last 150 years. The irreconcilable value systems of the village and the city. The city throbbing all around turned me into another being, even as I refused to budge. Such opposites are strewn all over his poetry, which lend an everlasting tension to his poetry and enlarge its spectrum. How he metamorphosed from the assertion, my tongue shall henceforth chant no names of gods. That was the time when he was a communist. To the exhortation later, tongue ruthlessly filled the barrenness of skies with the gods' names has to be seen to be believed. So is the way he untiringly tries to link ancient Indian wisdom to modern science and technology, regardless of the revivalist abuses showered on him. Indeed, he unabashedly pleads for the revival of the Indian Kali Yuga calendar, a unified Devanagari script for all Indian languages, and the resurrection of Sanskrit. Tradition for him is no fossil. It needs to be purposefully integrated into the modern times. So is it with his poetic tradition. In one of the finest poems in Malayalam, and I would venture to say, perhaps in any Indian language, the poem is called The Eternal Cloud, Nitya Megha. He seeks to redefine the role of tradition. In numerous poems, he problematizes the dichotomy between faith and reason. Why wear the sacred thread, the Etnobhaveda? What signifies a Brahmin? Talking of Brahminism, Akitam approached the problem of removing untouchability more as the consummation of his all-encompassing love than as a social reformation measure. He wrote about the untouchables not on account of a need to be politically correct, but because of his spiritual communion with them. He would be in the forefront of organizing yagas and be ridiculed by all the people in Kerala, but would not swerve from the ideal of popularizing Vedic studies among non-Brahmins and Dalits. Even the stupendous work of translating Bhagavata into Malayalam, which he took up after the age of 75 or 80, was aimed at making it intelligible to all. Culture is no reserve forest for him. Sex, parenthood, family, every aspect of life is a cause for celebration in Akitam's poetry. He embraces both the farmer's slang and the heightened Sanskritized poetic diction of the Vedas. Both folk tunes and intricate Sanskrit meters occur to him naturally. So do sonnets. So do muktagas, independent slokas, and some of the finest children's words in Malayalam written by Akitam. So will you find some of the best allegoric contemplative poetry in his body of work. Judge Akitam in terms of verbal felicity. Judge him in terms of ease. Judge him in terms of abundance. The parameters of copiousness, variety, and subtlety Akitam would score on all counts. But his fame does not rest on these accomplishments. Most likely, it would rest on the limitless compassion reflecting in his poetry. Compassion for children, compassion for the disabled, compassion for the underprivileged. Tears of this compassion irrigate his poetic landscape. Indeed, the teardrop around which he has woven new myths, not one, at least two, is a major motif of his poetry. Tears are nothing but life-giving water. Water and not fire is Akitam's basic element. 
it cannot be otherwise with a poet who wrote about the failure of a much acclaimed revolution we will uh, look at another short poem its translation and move on to the second poet this is titled parama dukham the greatest sorrow i wanted to listen to the tune innale padiravil chinniya poonilavil enneyum marannu nyanalinnu nilke taane nyanurakane pottikaranju poi taragavyuham pettennu lanju poi karanam chodichilla padirakili polum kaatten viyappu thulli thudachu milla charatte maramotta paalila polichilla paridam kathayonnu marinju milla kaaladichu vattile pullum kulungilennal karyam nyano raalodum paranju milla endenne nikku polum chindikkan kariyathade mattila paranodu nartidam and here is my translation of the poem as the ultimate anguish as uh, students and scholars of literature and other arts you will know that translation is a very difficult thing to attempt and achieve whatever i do i can't recreate the music of this poem in my translation here is just a prose rendering the ultimate anguish parama dukha Yesterday night I stood in the glistening moonlight all alone forgetting myself I burst into tears and screamed aloud the galaxies trembled all of a sudden nightingales did not enquire why nor did the night breeze wipe away my sweat the tree beside did not drop even a single leaf the world did not know a thing the grass beneath my feet did not even cure nor did i tell this to anyone how do i relate to others what i myself cannot comprehend how do i relate to others what i myself cannot comprehend we come to the second poet sugada kumari she was far removed from the philosophic ambience in which akitam was placed but there is one element of commonality in akitam and sugada kumari is that they were always claiming unlike the third poet whom we would see now Akitam and Sugada Kumari always claim that it is not we who write it is someone else who writes for us we are only an agent or a tool or a medium our third poet will not agree to this more about it later we start with a simple poem by Sugada Kumari short and simple only the translation what color is love what color is love white it is like mother's milk falling drop by drop drop by drop on the famished lips of a tender baby what color is love it is white like the mother's milk what is the color of love red it is glowing like the red red rose petals opening out in vigorous joy a flame with all the thirst and dreams of youth 
tell me what color is love like the midsummer sun fire and smoke and brilliant light it is crown of dazzling gold on the forehead's width tell me what color is love at even tide at the nadir of weariness when trembling lips try to shape the last words the holy water falls drop by drop drop by drop love is so soothing cold hot tears fall drop by drop drop by drop love is so burning hot in the throes of the last thirst on the scorched lips love comes flowing in it fills it flows over it is full what color is love it is fullness it is perfection it has no color at all i believe this will introduce you to the world of another poet to me as glorious as revered as my own mother she has uh, a, a saying in her one of her prose pieces that it still reads like poetry i will begin by quoting that to this torrential flood add my tear drop to this torrential flood add my tear drop to this flowing howling hurricane add my life breath to this howling hurricane add my life breath to this glorious resplendent add my grateful smile to this glorious resplendent add my grateful smile sudha kumari started publishing poetry in the 1950s i always argue that that is the richest decade of malayalam poetry and may i say the next quarter of century like the people whom we talked about shankara kurup balamani amma and velopulli cheerfully took note of her distinct voice fellow poets many of them practitioners of the modernist poetry which we will not discuss here readily acknowledged her elemental difference and the succeeding generation despite theoretical objections finds it hard to dispute her creative mastery 60 years later as she passed away her poetry continued to engage popular imagination on the one hand and engender critical interest on the other a little bit of biography sudha kumari's matrilineal roots trace back to a village called aranmula a, a historic temple town i should say an ancient historic temple town of central travancore on the banks of the river pampa famous for its pageantry of snake boats her mother did her masters from the university of madras in sanskrit and retired as professor her father bodheshwarin was a protean wrestler gandhian freedom fighter social reformer and sanyasin he was better known as a poet his kerala ganam incidentally our state's official song was a marching song for all those who fought for the unification of Travancore, Cochin and Malabar. Sugada did her schooling in Tiruvannantapuram and her home was verily a literary hub. Bodheshwaran was a great source of inspiration. He would recite poetry aloud. Katyayani Emma, her mother, would introduce her to the best of world literature. Sugada's elder sister Hridaya Kumari, a brilliant student of English, went on to become a reputed teacher and a distinctively good author sujatha devi her younger sister who is again no more was a robust poet of exceptional merit incidentally all these three members are kerala sahitya academy awardees most likely an unparalleled confluence of literary consanguinity sujatha did her honors in philosophy and proceeded to do her doctoral dissertation in comparative philosophy on the concept of moksha 
In 1960, she got married to Dr. Velayath Nair and moved on to Delhi, which was to be the backdrop of many of her poems in the 1960s. <coughs> she stayed there for a decade. Dr. Nair was an author, academician, and scholar, primarily in psychology. He encouraged Sugata in her literary pursuits and immeasurably assisted her in other spheres of work. I am I am saying this because. uh in the case of akitam and vishnara and nambudri this aspect is perhaps not very important but it is very very important here it is easy for a husband to feel envious and jealous of his wife's achievements sugada has explicitly recounted her love admiration and gratitude to her soulmate in more than one poem she has also touchingly sung at length of her bereavement in many of her recent poems i should say later poems daughter sister lover wife and mother the tragedy of indian womanhood is never complete sans widowhood sugada's only daughter lakshmi devi is a poet and lyricist with two collections of poems and several awards to her credit we talked about nv krishna warrior the polymath poet and we quoted him in uh, the yesterday's lecture so gada gratefully reminisces that but for the intervention and encouragement of another literary savant the polymath nv krishna warrior her life would have taken an entirely different course nv was the editor of the premier journal madhubhumi and she had sent a poem for publication under a nom de plume Envy with his indefatigable penchant for sporting literary talent, wholeheartedly welcomed her writings and published her poem in under her own name. It was Envy who published her first important poem, Kaliya Mardanam. Probably the publication of Kaliya Mardanam determined the trajectory of Sugada's literary career. You know. Uh, the story of kaliya is well known but here kaliya requests krishna not to stop trampling on his head the stoicism of this kaliya subverted the picture of the puranic kaliya and demanded pluralistic readings here is the kaliya speaking never were these hoods lowered never did his soul weep do not ever stop this dance my soul merges into a rapturous cadence was it a manifestation of feminine masochism with sexual undertones was it another instance of the oppressed unwittingly and quiescently submitting before the oppressor these are the readings which we have in kerala or was it total supplication of the bhakta even in the face of the worst adversities interestingly sugada herself has written about the birth of this poem how eliots i have seen them riding seaward on the waves initially prompted it how she wrote on unconsciously and how the details of krishna's image atop kaliya presented themselves before her without her ever having to look for them she would have us believe that she identified with the serpent kaliya unknowingly and that it was the story of man forever damned to persist with his agonizing karma man who emerges stronger since he accepts all that anguish as divine blessings possibly the poem is about all that but what is important is that it subtly presaged the three major strands of her poetry the soft and delicate feminine love ever pining and unrealized unrelenting resistance against mounting injustice and absolute devotion to god unabashed of idolatry what is more it also pointed to another cardinal element in her poetry the ever recurring theme of krishna what indeed distinguished sugada's early writings was a sense of inconsolable sorrow the dreamland was perpetually dusky 
and an all pervading melancholy subdued and shrouded her youthful love she named a poem and a collection the wings of darkness discerning readers had perceived it but it was again nv krishna warrior who went into at length in the grand preface i would say it is a historic document he wrote to one of her celebrated collections called pavam manava hridayam pity the human heart he confessed that he was not at all in agreement with sugada's pensive outlook on life at the same time he conceded that he was mesmerized by the abiding charm of her poetry after minutely analyzing the political and philosophical origins of her poetry he also prophesied that a poet who could empathize with humanity at large as in the poem which i just talked about pity the human heart it sees a lonely star and forgets the long night pity the human heart it sees a lonely star and forgets the long night pity the human heart it sees a passing drizzle and forgets the long drought pity the human heart it sees a passing drizzle and forgets the long drought pity the human heart seeing a milky smile it forgets death and rejoices pity the human heart and we said that this philosophy cannot but turn to a healthier and more spirited world view and it would consummate in karma yoga Envy's prediction came true, despite Sugada's lack of trust in what he said. Many poems with overt political content, deliberating on the state of the nation, appeared in the early seventies. Her reaction to the fa- infamous emergency was ironic and ambivalent. We have got what we deserve. We remain tame. We have turned the chalice of liberty. bottom up and when mrs indira gandhi lost the elections sugada wrote another poem pradarshini we loved you so dearly and mindful of allegations of siding with the oppressor sugada's poetry underwent a sea change with her participation in the conservationist movement i don't know how many of you have heard about the silent valley struggle which we had in the late 70s and early 80s the struggle against the proposed hydroelectric project in the silent valley rainforest was the first of its kind in kerala and i will even say uh, perhaps the first of its kind in india she along with many other fellow poets including vishwanarayan nambudri founded the prakriti samrakshana samiti for conservation of nature in 1980 and organized concentration programs all over the state concern for environment has permanently defined the course of her life and poetry thereafter understandably so because it integrates well with the gandhian tenets which form the bedrock of her philosophy another important concern of her life was the mentally challenged women empathy consummated into action in 1985 with the founding of abhaya an organization for the welfare of the mentally ill she looked at the mental patients hapless mental patients living in subhuman conditions within the government mental asylums abhaya focused public attention influenced government policies and appealed to the judiciary for radical reforms in the mental health sector please remember she is primarily a poet but her time was mostly spent on may i say quote on quote non poetic themes and discourses fortunately all this work did not dry up the springs of her poetry on the contrary they reinforced each other and augmented their resources reciprocally verily the ever larging spectrum of extra literary activism and its symbiotic relationship to her work has sharpened her sensitivity and deepened her understanding of human misery by the way she was also the first chairperson of kerala's women's commission 
but even sugada obdurate hardened and stoic as she was over the years she could not bear to see the indescribably brutal instances of violence meted out to the women and girls of her highly literate progressive state basking in the glory of matriarchal power ankita must be telling her friends about how great her state of kerala is i am debunking what she is telling all of you victims of dowry deaths domestic violence incest pedophilia organized sex rackets all these continually streamed before her for five long years among the perpetrators and abettors of these savage crimes were the rich the mighty and the famous she antagonized many of them if not most of them and brought forth calumny and slander upon herself she remained remarkably agile in spirit and resolute in purpose till the last breath of her life the protracted public literacy indigation the financial strain of running abhaya and she was a great reader a very fast reader too a conscientious objector she has remained the proverbial thorn in the flesh of the so called leftists of kerala and the so called rightists of kerala allegations of hindutva by fellow writers in silent terms and even louder terms did not deter the believer in her condemnations of ideological inadequacy by partisan feminists only reinvigorated her in the midst of it all she continued to write i i brought out a short collection of her 15 poems after her death perhaps this has been possible on account of the exceptional rapidity of her creative process which i told you she says i was the i'm not the one who writes she says that her intellect is unaware and unconscious of the ways in which an idea converts itself into a verbal construct very often she only transcribes on to paper what has taken shape within as though it is in a kaleidoscope such a process will not pause for grammatical exactitude or prosodic perfection hence her prediction for free flowing tunes despite her adeptness in working with intricate sanskrit meters and she says i sing only for those who resonate on the same mega heads with me that is the samana hridayas or the sahridayas she infuses the utmost emotive quality in her compositions and by an unexplained prefatory silence which she used to lull the audience into readiness before she ever started writing reciting her poems her essentially lyrical imagination may revel or at least been seen to be reveling in emotional extravagance but the abandon and ease with which she created the effect is a matter of envy for all the poets of malayalam historically and intrinsically sugada will remain one of the most important poets of malayalam and it is no mean achievement to hold sway on a bigoted community like that of kerala for over half a century or about 60 years in one's lifetime here is one of her later poems we read that poem and conclude uh, this uh, section on sugada kumari apart from mentally ill women her major concern was children basically children who are sexually abused and abandoned the title of the poem is butchered children are a flocking butchered children are a flocking standing in the midst of this metropolis i see them butchered children coming silently staring eyes bruised lips broken tender necks a dangling shattered bosoms crushed bodies ties with blood spattered stains slaughtered children are a crowding they are coming to seek us out holding out their hands how they would have screamed before dying trembling with fear trembling with fear tired tortured tormented writhing in pain how they would have shrieked before dying unknown children prancing and playing before us lighting up the house with their smiles kissing us 
clasping their little hands around our necks, our dearest darlings, how little they knew that we were demons incarnate. Slain children are a thronging. Earth is shaking at their footfalls. The sun is turning black. The rains are hiding in fear. Trees are shedding leaves. Featherless sparrows are dropping down dead. Murdered children are a swarming. The sky is all screams. The ocean leans back and growls, ready to pounce. Murdered children are a swarming, seeking us out, holding out their hands, wailing, wailing. Where are the mothers? Where are the fathers? Where are the saviors? Where are the revered preceptors? Where are the sermonizing bishops? Where are the leaders? Where are the guardians of law? Where that blind goddess balancing justice? Massacred children are a coming. Let us flee and hide in our burrows before they see us with their staring eyes, before they touch us with their lifeless hands, before their crushed lips damn us with curses. Let us close our mouths, eyes and ears and hide. Let us fume to death in the burning graves of this earth so defiled by us. I come to the third poet, Vishwanarayana Nambudri, my mentor, my revered preceptor. I will start with a short poem, Taittiriya. I should forewarn you that he was based in Vedas. He was based in the Upanishads. And it was his life's breath. Whatever he spoke about, whatever he even thought about, was in the loftiest of terms. That is exactly what endeared him to the first two poets, Akitam and Sukhada Gumari. Sukhada Gumari unabashedly used to say that, though he is six years younger to me, he is my elder brother and my guru. And what is most important about Vishnuji, as Danino calls him, is that he was a humble dissenter. He never stopped short of dissenting, but he never shouted. He was dissenting with all humility. I'm saying this pointedly because we have so many people who, was, who are dissenting loudly, an insurgent dissent. An insurgent dissent is a prerequisite of celebrityhood these days. Vishnarayana Nambudri steered clear of it, clear of it consciously. Here is the poem, Taitiriya, in which he humbly places himself vis-a-vis -vis the other poets, perhaps of Malayalam, perhaps of all the world. Taitiriya. Plenty of grains, a plate full of milk, and a swing for the parrot in a cage of gold. Plenty of grains, a plate full of milk, and a swing for the parrot in a cage of gold. And as the guests arrived, deferential chanting of eulogies and crooning in others' voices. And as the guests arrived, deferential chanting of eulogies and crooning in others' voices. It's fate, though, that its feathers shall not touch the blue expanse around the cage. It's fate, though, that its feathers shall not touch the blue expanse around the cage. Behold then the titiri bird. Behold then the titiri bird, perennial wanderer, pecking at whatever he gets, he who moves combing the horizons, he whose lips hum only the sacred hymns. The titiri bird, he who moves combing the horizons, 
he whose lips hum only the sacred hymns behold his little wings piercing the gale behold his little wings piercing the gale behold him soar stretching the vast skies dangling on his wings behold him soar stretching the vast skies dangling on his wings as it have been apparent to you it is a selfie in modern terms he is drawing his own picture and equating himself with a tithiri bird who refuses to be caged and who always pierces the gale and soars with the sky dangling on his little wings you would also say that his education was traditional in nature as that of akitam but it was very different in that he formally studied physics student of physics and he was a great student of the history of physics and the history of science he turned to english after his graduation and he had learned sanskrit traditionally under his grandfather who was a scholar of sanskrit this is a curious mixture of physics english and sanskrit this is what made him stand apart originally branded along with the modernists when he started writing in the 60s he was no longer considered to be one among them by the time he ended writing or even before indeed vishnu ji himself consciously moved away from the flock of the modern poets and did everything he could to proclaim his severance perhaps this was inevitable notwithstanding the fact that he was closely associated with them from the early days it was he who edited one of the first collections of modern poetry in malayalam pudu mudragal the new impressions he was also one of the founder members of the group called kerala kavitha the modernist poetry journal but even as he was involved in all this he was journeying back to his roots in time to his family's roots on the one hand and to the roots of the vedic philosophic tradition and the upanishadic philosophic tradition on the other i have myself seen is writing all the major upanishads in hand and writing commentaries on each upanishad it was not just reading them or even learning them by rote as early as in 1967 when he was not even 30 years old he wrote addressing his family deity countless paths countless paths coil round and again i come back to you here in the prospect he was talking to his own poetry words libre was the order of the day yet he would not have anything to do with poetry of that sort even his own mentors by the way envy was his mentor too like that of sugada even envy has two poems in prose but vishnu ji will not have it and we probably had better belief in the poetic tradition even he tried to seek his hand at the modern jana but vishnu ji was steadfast in his allegiance to verbal music defined by metrical patterns indeed even in his 20s when he started writing he was interested in the more complicated variations of meters and as for choice of subjects his range was surprisingly large when he was barely 22 years old he chose to write about the moment of revelation of gautama buddha in a poem called bodhodaya i shudder to think what will happen to malayalam if one of our poets of present day at that age will ever write about this sort of themes 
an year later he wrote about the dilemma of lakshmana who had to tell sita of rama's decision to desert her in the forest the consummate artistry and verbal control with which vishnu ji managed these two themes should eternally remain as object lessons for any practicing poet in malayalam i am only saying that it should remain it has not remained as an object lesson unfortunately one could also assert now with the benefit of hand sign side that in these two poems the birth of greater poetry was heralded but these themes also demanded philosophical discussions of the right and wrong and diction which was suited and exalted this was what probably led him to search for words with pan indian currency or more specifically words drawn directly from sanskrit scriptures this has manifested in two interesting ways one is even uh, there is an excessive use of words which cried out for footnotes for example the word juhu juhu is that spoon a ladle sort of thing which you use in the yaga it is not a word which was used in malayalam for the last 50 years or 100 years in poetry i mean that was the initial phase in the second phase or the later phase even the simplest of words meant much more he says the word balya does not mean childhood alone it is one of the three stages to be attained by seekers of knowledge it is easy to get caught up in the vortex of philosophy because of its high sounding jargon and general vague acceptability what is significant in vishnu's career is that he resisted this temptation from the very beginning and resisted it successfully the temporal world is not to be denied it is ever present in his poetry with all its aspects abominable and endearing politics space shuttle poverty war and the fathomless theme of love his first collection was an ode on liberty swarantha kurichu oru geetham the second one was pranaya geethangal songs of love and the third earth songs bhumi geethangal he was objected to by the christian orthodoxy of kerala for a poem called adam and the god they objected to that a poem being included in textbooks and his own temple authorities where he went and served as a high priest for 3 years soon after his retirement in 1990 to force the vedas that one should not cross the seas what i'm trying to say is for both the christian orthodoxy and the hindu orthodoxy he was an alien on the more relevant national politics of the current day vishnu ji looked up to initially gandhism and in his later days to jayaprakash narayan and he was one of those very few poets who prophesied the coming of emergency in the early 70s as a matter of fact he stopped writing he stopped writing for 3 years almost he did not write till the day of the election results in 1977 mahabharata ramayana and most importantly kalidasa whom he had imbibed in his blood even before he started his schooling comes back to him as the archetype of the indian poet we talked about akitam's poem nityamekha vishnu ji is the other poet who has two important poems on kalidasa one is called o kalidasa itself there is another poem a more celebrated poem called the days and nights of ujjain 
he has a strange phrase the fashion that is india which also became the name of one of his collections again he invokes kalidasa in the poem vishnu ji's poetic career affords a strange vision it was never static it grew from strength to strength even as it grew old ever modern ever old one might say he used to say chira purana and chira nutana it is probably because he sharpened his knowledge with the recent advancements in science on the one hand and a return to the vedas on the other hand he also combines in him a perceptive critic a literary theorist and one of the finest translators of kalidasa in malayalam vishnu ji's poetry is also highly highly people you will see einstein heisenberg sophocles and all those people there and he has a poem called the einstein's guest and it is a, a poem on the meeting of heisenberg and einstein in 1954 at princeton i wonder if there is any poet in india or out of india who ever thought of making it as a theme for a poem and his ideas of sex i have seen many readers and even critics of vishnu ji mindlessly associating him with spirituality sanctity and self righteousness in a narrow mindedly moralistic manner but the poet in vishnu ji never shunned indeed he ever embraced the primacy of physicality in other words the communion of male and female bodies his poem vanaprastha written in 1994 just before he took over as the high priest of the ancient temple at his place of birth and he was 55 years old at the time after retirement addresses his wife as the boiling lava of my loins you won't expect a priest to talk about sex that is taboo and lo look at the some of the poems he wrote while he was a priest replete with sensuous imagery brimming with sensual yearnings vedas don't forbid sex he would argue unapologetically not for him the christian concept of sin and redemption vishnu ji's ideals of holiness and purity as i told you went far beyond those propounded by religious orthodoxy in one of his poems called brahmadatta he addresses this issue tell me is it the wish for offspring or is it carnal desire that comes as the spark of creation there is another poem by the mitravati which he liked most he she says an alliance without souls touching each other isn't that the sin a mating of mere bodies isn't that a false act i should also say that he was the right hand of sudha kumar ichachi in the environmentalist movement and his environmentalist face is uh, important in the sense that as i told you uh, it is only an integration of his other beliefs i would say that uh, he was perhaps the handsomest poet of malayalam perhaps the first recipient of nanpit shankara gurup may vie with him but his charisma was unbeatable and even people who have only seen him once or who chance to see him on a tv screen fell in love with him his intellect his memory his suppleness in every term was enviably large and his political stance though not in tune with what is politically correct it was always morally right i bow to my most most favorite poet with a poem another poem in which he defines himself like in the poem saitiriya 
I have seen the triumphant march of white. I have seen the triumphant march of white. Jasmine in bloom, dewdrop on a pebble, day with a drooping April sun. I have seen the triumphant march of white, a virgin smile, an aged star in the sky, moving with honoring steps. I have seen the triumphant march of white, sandal mark on forehead. Please mark it. I have seen the triumphant march of white. We have a writer in Kerala who said, I am afraid of people who are with sandal mark on their foreheads. The sandy shore where waves practice writing. The half open spray of the palm tree flower. A slice of moon on suckling tender lips. I have seen the triumphant march of white. Soothing hand on a feverish body. The faltering tongue bidding adieu. And as the dusk falls, the vague knowledge that seeps in secretly about an un unknown act of kindness. And the relief that remains like a glowing ember as flames of fiery suspicion die down. I have seen the triumphant march of white. I should stop here. I understand and appreciate that I have not done justice to the three poets. I also understand that I did not speak about the poets who are contemporaneous with these poets. And I did not speak at all about the poets who came after. But that's another story. <laughs>